seat. I'm going to get started here. So first of all, I'd like to say, wow, the room is a buzz. This is kind of what we dreamed about when this library was designed, was to have events like this where you can come and just hear authors and learn all kinds of things that um, you get firsthand opportunity to talk to people about. So tonight, you all know you're here for the Say Hey Kid, so I don't need to tell you about that. But I'm just going to give a little bit of introductory information about our library. Um, we have a unique situation here where the city, the county, the foundation, the friends all go together to make this library happen. And so, you know, we're very happy to see you guys here. Any way that you can find to support the library is very appreciated. And one of my favorites is for you to come to our used bookstore because, believe it or not, those books you donate and then we turn around and sell, we're able to donate up to six figures a year um, out of those proceeds. And that's part of how programs like this are paid for. So anyway, I'm going to be really short. I just want to get right to the point because we've got a lot of fun things to talk about tonight. My name is Ruth Thornburg. I am a member of the committee, the Sweet Thursday Committee that puts these events together. And I often get to do a lot of the interviewing. And tonight, I'm going to actually introduce someone else who's going to do this interview. And many of you may know his name, uh, Mike Sampa. He's a local fellow that um, you may have read his columns in the Contra Costa Sun. They were always good for a big chuckle. And I know he gets nudged every now and then to continue to write. But uh, Mike is a communications executive. He has more than 40 years of experience in public and private sectors. He's won awards for corporate business writing and public relations campaigns. Um, he's, more importantly, he's raised the profile of international corporate leaders and transformed the reputation of major business organizations. I know that the Zampas lived overseas while he was doing work with different shipping companies and has been involved with the Port of Oakland. So anyway, Mike, I first met, I think, on the Little League field with when my son was there. And so I know he has a strong interest in baseball. And so when this event came up, I thought, mm, you know, I. I know a little bit about baseball, but I'm no expert, so I wanted someone who really could carry the, carry the theme. So anyway, Mike will be doing the interview tonight, and as you know, the author that we have, his name is John Shea, and most of you probably know him through the San Francisco Chronicle. He has been a national baseball writer and columnist. He's been covering baseball for four decades, and most of that right here in the Bay Area. Um, he has five books that he's written about baseball, including the New York Times bestseller with uh, Willie Mays, 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. He also has a Ricky Henderson autobiography, Off Base, Confessions of a Thief, and his latest book published in June of 2022, Long Shot, Building Homes, Dreams, and Baseball Teams. He's also the consulting producer on the HBO documentary, Say Hey Willie Mays. So if you haven't had a chance, check that out as well. And then, and also tonight, we're going to have an amazing display of photographs going on in the background. And I wanted to talk about the photographer, um, a top-tier sports photographer for over 30 years, freelancer Brad Mangan has regularly covered assignments for Sports Illustrated and Major League Baseball. Oh, are we okay there? Okay. He's acclaimed for his iconic images of everything from the 1996 Summer Olympic Games in Atlanta to the 2015 World Series between Kansas City Royals and the New York Mets. His incomparable archive contains images of some of the most memorable moments in sports over the past few decades, and he's the founder and owner of SportsShooter.com, an online sports photography resource. So I think to start, I'm going to have Brad just step up for a minute and give you just a little briefing on what photographs you're going to be seeing, because it's quite a, it's a unique opportunity to see those. So come on up, Brad.
Thanks. This will be real quick because you want to see John and Mike. Um, I put together about 60 pictures, many of them rare, never seen before, from different museum collections and archives of famous old photographers of Willie's career spanning from when he first started playing in Birmingham through last year. And I'm going to go through the pictures in chronological order in the background. There'll be obviously no captions or explanation, but you'll just be able to see what's going on to enjoy, to enhance the discussion that's going to go on tonight. So a lot, some of these pictures were in the book. A lot of them weren't. And, if, and you always see the same pictures of Willie. Not tonight. You're going to see stuff that you've never seen before. So that's it. OK, Mike. Mike and John, come on up here and let's get this thing started. Okay. Turnout. We want to thank the Lafayette Library for having us here, uh, and especially for having Brad, because he was able to remind my wife, who was a newspaper person, about all her old photographer boyfriends. So Brad, thanks a heck of a lot for that one. I'm really thrilled. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wasn't going to go on about John's book, but what a treat. Preeminent baseball writer in the United States. Uh, the protagonist, Willie Mays, and the big bonus, if you grew up in the Bay Area, the memories that are found in his book, from the four home run game in Milwaukee to the McCovey line drive dying in Bobby Richardson's glove at second base, it's all in there. Uh, and we'll get into it as the night goes on. Uh, what I hope to do quickly, and we do have a time limit, sadly, uh, what I hope to do is talk about how the book came to be, 24, um, what's in the book, and then I'm going to leave it to you folks to ask questions of general interest about baseball. Please somebody ask about the pitch clock and ask about the Oakland A's, because he's got views on all of those things. <laughs> is, is Rob Manford or John Fisher here today? <laughs> Good. Any, anything goes. Let's go. We have a great crowd of folks, a lot of good friends here. I want to introduce three people um, who, if I accidentally say anything intelligent tonight, it's their doing. Uh, the triumvirate of editors retired now from the San Francisco Chronicle who uh, helped John through all those nights at the ballpark. So if you'd stand just really quickly, Glenn Swars, Larry Ant, Dave Dayton, please get up. I would have introduced Scott Osler, but he used to give me trouble when I was a PR guy, so I'm not introducing Scott Osler. So uh, let's get right into it. And John, for starters, your two-sentence, no more, two-sentence mm. elevator speech on uh, why, not why, uh, what's the book about? And number two, why is it called 24? You said two minutes? Two sentences. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. The greatest player ever, an American hero, an inspiration to millions, a story that needed to be told because so many books written about him were kind of takeoffs on previous books. So this one is totally original with, original, totally uh, fresh without a bibliography and without, um, Anything in a previous book or, or, or documentary or magazine article that was kind of off limits to this. So everything is, is, is new and with Willie Mays' blessing and 200 interviews of his closest friends, teammates, Negro Leagues um, legends and on and on, I, I just thought it was a story that needed to be told. Everybody knows he was number 24. Why else is this book called 24? Well, um, 
the Jackie Robinson movie was 42. Um, and that was taken. And so, so, so this is, uh, you switch the numbers around, and that's what he wore. But mostly it's 24 chapters. It, 24 is kind of an iconic number anywhere. I mean, if I look at the Brewers or the Twins, and someone's wearing 24, and I don't recognize it, that guy doesn't belong wearing a 24. Ricky Henderson in Oakland, Rick Barry, the Warriors, and, and the Say Hey Kid who started it all, 24, it's just, there, there, there's a whole lot to, to the number. And I think a lot of generations will look at that and say, that's, it's a lot more meaningful than just a number. But it's broken down into 24 chapters, 24 lessons to begin each chapter. And I think that's the answer you're looking for. Exactly. Um, you said you had Willie Mays's blessing. I'm told from the Chronicle Mafia that Willie Mays doesn't talk to a lot of reporters. I'm also told that at the height of his career and controversy, Barry Bonds talked to basically no reporters. The one exception on both counts, you. How do you develop that kind of mm. rapport and trust with the biggest superstars in baseball history? Wow, that's a loaded question, but I think it has to do with listening and hanging out and being there and respecting the history, respecting the man, the woman, whoever it might be. But shoot, I was a kid watching Mays like so many others in the room were in the 60s into the 70s and never imagined that I would ever you know, get to meet him or talk with him or write a book with him. And by the way, it's a co-authored book, so if anybody ever wants to write a bestseller, just make sure Willie Mays is your co-author. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I got into the newspaper business. I grew up in the Bay Area in Marin County, and um, you know he was the guy. And we all tried to be like him. We all tried to be. I'm sure a lot of people in this room had baseball cards of Willie Mays. What, what, what was his height and weight? Five ten. Yeah, five ten, one eighty, right? And and so we all wanted to be five ten, one eighty. You know, that's <laughs> perfect. You know, I used to be one eighty. <laughs> And my driver's license says I'm 5'10". <laughs> but he, he uh, I mean, in 1988, I came back here to the Bay Area after working in the 80s covering the Padres to cover the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants, Roger Craig, Tony La Russa, Will Clark, and the Bash Brothers. And then Willie Mays, who was thrown out of the game uh, by Bowie Kuhn, a wonderful commissioner who thought it was the, the best thing I could do is throw Willie and Mickey Mantle out of the game because of their associations with gamblers. Well, you might be following the news now that the Oakland A's are going to move right next to a casino and they're going to have a betting window right outside their door. But this was 1979, like two minutes after he got into the Hall of Fame, he was kicked out of baseball. And, an, and Peter Uberoth, who ran the 1984 Olympics, First thing he did, I said, what, what's the biggest PR move I could make that people would love? Oh, bring Willie and Mickey back into the game. So he's on the cover of Sports Illustrated, they're back, and Uberoth, you know, turned out to be a genius. Well, it was common sense, really. So that was 1985, and then uh, Al Rosen and Bob Lurie of the Giants brought him back to the Giants in 86. Then I came back up to the Bay in 88, covering the Giants, and he was always there because he was an employee, he was an ambassador, he was an assistant to the president. I think his title was Willie Mays. That's all he, that's all he needed. So he, he was around, so when I saw him in holding court, uh, I just said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm your Huckleberry, I'll, I'll be there with you guys, and um, wrote a lot about him, and he must have trusted me because he kept talking with me, and um, we developed a relationship. He, <laughs> He did, he did kind of criticize me one time. He said, hey, John, that was a good story, but you got something wrong. And I said, oh, that's the worst thing to hear, right? And I said, what was it? He says, I'm not 5'10", I'm 5'11". <laughs> I said, okay, you're 5'11", <laughs> which is the cutest thing ever because, you know, the high school, uh, you know, the stats or the roster rounds it up to six feet. He rounds it up to 5'11". I said, okay, you're 5'11". From now on, every time I write a story in the book, he's 5'11". So those baseball cards are wrong. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I got to know him really well, and in 2005, I, I said, hey, what about a book project? He didn't say yes or no. He said, I'd like to see this book in classrooms. I said, I guess that's a yes. So 
moving forward, obviously the inspirational slant that it became. Good. I read a, a great line in a novel last week. A magazine editor throws a manuscript on a writer's desk, says you're a hundred sentences too short and a thousand words too long. And I struggled with what that meant and I think I came up with it. Every sentence needs to have a subject. This writer's work didn't have much subject matter, so he filled the void with a lot of gas bag empty words. The antithesis of your book, which is overflowing with substantive information about the sport at Willie Mays. Uh, and again, your Chronicle Mafia said that didn't happen just by spending three hours in the archives. Tell us about the, the process of researching this book, uh, the scope of it, the volume of stuff, how long it took. Well, like I, like I said, I, I asked him about the book in 2005, and we didn't sign a deal till 2018. So that's a lot of groundwork and a long time to write a proposal. And I wrote three or four of them, and none of them made any sense. And my good friend, Kurt Mangin, who worked with me on the um, book as my friend and editor, along with Brad Mangin, who was responsible for those 90-some photos in the book, all these rare uh, shots that you might see behind me, a lot of them there, um, at least the ones that we got licensed for. <laughs> and the ones we didn't, you'll see tonight. Um, but yeah, I, it goes back a long way, but like you said, it, the relationship mattered, and I didn't pester them or push them, and every once in a while I said, hey, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do that. I said, okay. But in the meantime, I made sure to speak with a whole lot of people who might have been in their 90s, like Alvin Dark, who was his manager um, in the early 60s, and that's a side story in itself, just to make sure I had it in case there was a Willie Mays book I would write. And, you know, Vince Scully and Roger Angel, the great New York author, and um, Alan Hanno, who, who wrote a book, a Day in the Bleachers, who was there in the 1954 World Series and, and captured so eloquently in his book. So I, I, I tried to speak with as many people who uh, kind of up there in age, just in case. So I had all this information even before the book came reality. And then once I signed, the first thing I did, well, the angels were in town. So I'm going to go over and talk to Mike Trout. So not only is it folks in their 90s, but a lot of folks who, you know, are in their 20s and supposedly the next Willie Mays, which really isn't the case because uh, it's impossible. But yeah, so it, it, you know, 200 interviews and going back to Birmingham for a week or two to um, research his childhood and hang out with his lifetime buddies and visit the field that you might have seen in the news lately called Rickwood Field, which is the oldest uh, professional ballpark in the country, uh, uh, 1910, older than Wrigley, old, older than Fenway. And it's the only ballpark that Mays played in at the big league level that's still in existence. Candlestick Park and Seal Stadium and the Polo Grounds and Shea Stadium, all, all gone. But Rickwood Field is where the Giants and Cardinals next year are going to play in the Field of Dreams game. And this is like in the neighborhood in Birmingham. And you walk in and it's 1948 because anytime anything breaks, they try to replace it with something that looks like it was 48. And Willie was a sophomore in high school in 1948. And that was the year that was, um, you know, he led the Birmingham Black Barons to the final Negro Leagues World Series in 1948. So, you know, Jackie was up and Larry Doby was up and Willie and Hank and Ernie Banks, all those guys were on their way. So the Negro Leagues kind of, yeah, a lot of people lose an interest in following the Brooklyn Dodgers or the Cleveland Indians. So, um, but anyway, that's a long-winded answer to a question I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you had editors. Um, that's right. You sort of answered this before, and I forgot to ask. I'm going to ask again. Answer quickly this time. Um, the number of people like me who actually saw Willie Mays in person or on television is rapidly dwindling, uh, unfortunately. So why write a book with a mark that market mm. is shrinking? Well, like he said, he wanted to see in classrooms, meaning he wanted to target it to young adults, you know, who, who might be wondering, hey, do I go left or do I go right in life? And here's a guy who followed the, the right path, you know, coming from the deep south, the Jim Crow South and the Great Depression and 
uh, town of poverty, you know, this is 30 years uh, after he was born, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King called Birmingham the most segregated city in the country. So imagine 30 years earlier, that was Willie Mays' youth. So anyway, um, th there's, there's a lot to it in terms of, um, you know, the, the backstory and, and, you know, why he is the hero that he is because of what he overcame and he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't start fights, he didn't charge the mound ever. Um, meanwhile, Mickey Mantle across the river did all that and was up all night and, and caroused. And, you know, we all know, you know, those, those Yankee legends who are probably a lot more glorified in this country than Willie Mays, unfortunately, you know, for obvious reasons. But, you know, it was Mays who overcame a whole lot more than Mickey Mantle or those guys ever did because, you know, he went from the Negro Leagues and sophomore, junior, senior in high school, 48, 49, 50, the Giants sign him. He goes right from an all-black league to an all-white league. He's the only minority playing for the uh, Trenton Giants. And he's hearing the same stuff that Jackie was hearing three years earlier when Jackie broke in. And, and you know, it was disgraceful. It was disgusting. You know, one time he looked at me during the process of the book, and he said, John, I, I don't know if it was all worth it at the time. I, I was ready to pack up and go, to, go home. And it like brought tears to my eyes. I said, I said, you were, you know, thinking of going back and playing with the Black Barons or working in the mills like you're with your dad and getting odd jobs or whatever. And he said, yeah, but fortunately for us and the world and the baseball industry and mankind, he overcame all that stuff and didn't let the bigots win and turned out to be the hero that, you know, friend we all know now. Thank you for bringing that up. And that's, we're going to get back to race in the last question. Uh, but some of us come to these events because we think we could be writers too. Uh, we can't, but we think we can. But tell us about your process. You are a newspaper man. You spent a lot of nights at or after deadline hammering out 20, 25 inches. Uh, at 10 o'clock at night with these guys in your ear yeah. and you got 55 minutes to do it and the score here and the winning hit here and the quote from the manager here, it was a little formulaic but it was high, high pressure. Now you step into the author's milieu, you've got more time to do it but you've got a long story to unspool. Yeah. Is there a transition there? Oh. And I wonder if there was because I read a number of topic or, or lead sentences in your chapters <laughs> that were six, seven words, boom, right in the nose just like an editor would want. So was there a difference, uh, or were you straddling both kinds of writing? Boy, uh, all of that. Um, I, I tried to make, Willie and I tried to make this different, and it's unlike any book I've ever seen in that not only is it 24 chapters and every chapter begins with a lesson, but Willie is in boldface. So every page you're going to see input from Willie. So I kind of presented it as, you know, we're sitting at a bar, and talking with Willie, and then here comes Hank Aaron, and, and then here comes Bill Clinton, who's quoted in the book, and, um, you know, Bill Greeson, the legendary Negro Leagues teammate who's 98 and still going strong in Birmingham, and here comes Buster Posey from the modern era, and, and all have stories to tell because everybody has a Willie May story, and it, it's, it is unbelievable. In, in, in my common job, the day job, you know, you hope to get three or four out of ten people you reach out to to call back. And then when you say it's for a Willie Mays book, I'm batting a thousand, I'm ten out of ten. And I reached out to Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and they called me back. Because they had Willie Mays stories they wanted to share. They knew I wasn't going to talk about the Gulf War or, or anything that might have happened in the Oval Office. So... And, and the handler said, okay, you got 20 minutes. And it became 40 minutes for both of them. So every, everybody had, and, you know, and, and this momentous stuff. Um, Bill Clinton saying, you know, Willie Mays made it absurd to be a racist. And he said that. I said, whoa. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, title, of the absurdity of racism. And this whole chapter 17 is about just that, in which... There was an issue with Alvin Dark. There was an issue with buying a home in San Francisco. There was a 
issue with um, Johnny Roseboro and uh, all, all kinds of angles kind of come in together and you know it's it's Willie Mays who's 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 in the middle of it and not afraid to to open up and the access he gave gave me and I counted it up once more than a hundred hours I spent with him for the purpose of this book because I'd come over to his house and Willie two hours today you know two hours I'll be in and out and it's seven hours later and we're just hanging out and <laughs> and chilling and, and talking because he loves talking baseball. He loves talking to people who know what he did. And baseball is his life, man. I mean, you go to, I remember uh, there was Joe DiMaggio's house. He had nothing in his house about what he did. Um, there was a picture of Marilyn and that was it. But you go to Mays' house, it is a museum. I mean, he met nine presidents and they're all up there on the wall. And, um, just so incre incredible, you know, Brad's been there. And he took a lot of the pictures of those pictures that are in the book, which is extremely rare. But, but yeah, qu quite a topic. And, and the format with boldface in, in, on each page kind of brought you back to, you know, just a bunch of guys and gals talking together and Willie being the focus and everyone coming in and say, yeah, I got a story. Yeah, I got a story. And I bring that story back to Willie put it on the tee for him and he hit it out of the park like normal and that that was all part of the storytelling so it was it just kind of blew my mind how much access he gave me and how willing people were to to tell their part of the you know Willie Mays uh, narrative gotcha okay we're moving from how this book came to be to what's in it at 725 and I mentioned that because Ruth you made us start about 10 or 12 minutes late we're gonna want some <laughs> extra time because this is fascinating and I think people are really enjoying it um, so each chapter started with a, a nugget of advice from Willie Mays the young people he wanted it to be in school uh, did he give you those nuggets did he think them and you turned it into words yeah. or did you fabricate all of those <laughs> <laughs> yeah those are my lessons uh, no, um, because I've known him for so long and because I kind of know sometimes what he's thinking and what his purpose in life is and his goal on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I, and there were times where he would say something and I would say, okay, you know, write that down because that is a good lesson to start chapter 23 and on and on and on. So his, you know, sometimes as, uh, as a reporter or a writer, or even a biographer, um, you, you don't always use it word for word because it's grammatically wrong or the slang just doesn't hit well. Willie's slang is, is so beautiful that you, you want to leave it. But um, I, I think, um, yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I think with Willie, it, it, it all had to do with, with uh, with the with the amount of time he gave me and, and the fact that there are so many people involved, yeah. Um, so a dignified stance in the face of bigotry, um, desire to help kids. Uh, question, I want a one word answer. Is mm. Willie Mays a good guy? Yes. Okay, I asked that for this reason. Uh, we're the middle 60s, the late 60s. I come down to breakfast at my house in Castro Valley and open up the Chronicle like I do every day. We talked about this. And it's the day Glenn Dickey decided to become Glenn Dickey. And he started a years-long series of hit pieces called Columns uh, <laughs> that strap hangers on the New York subway would love. They'd recognize it from the Daily News or the Post. Uh, and on day one of his new career and new life, Glenn Dickey chose to do a smear job on Willie Mays. Uh, uh, Mean-spirited, self-centered, egotistical, uncooperative, really dumb. Um, and I want to tell you, for those of us, and there were a lot of us who idolized Willie Mays, this landed like a turd in the punch bowl. Um, and the next night on the broadcast, Lon Simmons does the hmm. disclaimer, uh, pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this broadcast without the consent of the Giants is prohibited. And if you do it, we're going to lock you in a room with Glenn yeah. Dickey. Um, <laughs> so what is it? Where did that come from? Is he uh, the prima donna egotistical superstar that is so stereotypical today? Or is he the good guy who wants to help kids and 
stand up against bigotry. Sounds like a great forward for his book. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the, uh, the folks you, you uh, called on might, might know a little bit more, but as a kid reading Glenn Dickey, it, it just seemed like he wanted to be the um, Howard Cosell of the print media. Um, and so not only did he criticize Willie Mays, he's the only person in Bay Area history who criticized both Mays and Montana. And why did he do that? Well, we're talking about it years later. That's why he did it, that's all. And it's like, well, look at me, you know, all these other wonderful writers out there, and there's a laundry list, um, and maybe I'm not at that level. Glenn's not here, is he? <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm not at that level, so what could I do? Maybe you see it on TV all the time, right? And what could I do to, to, um, to get hits, as we say now? Or, you know, um, generate readership, as we said then. It's, well, let's attack Mays in Montana. It's, everyone's going to read me, and I'm going to be out front on the green sheet. And um, that was him. Uh, am I telling it right? Glenn? Yeah. Thumbs up from Glenn Yeah, Smart. so it, it, it's, you know, he wanted to be different. And how are you different? Well, I'm not going to write what everybody else writes. I'm going to be the anti what everybody else writes. And uh, why the heck you ask, ask that question anyway? <laughs> you still thinking about Glenn Dickey after all these years? It's funny, and that's what, 65? That's more than 60, almost 60 yeah. years ago. And it's, well, if you're a Mays fan, that kind of thing sticks with you. You're not talking about Wells Twombly, right? I forgot about Wells Twombly. Yeah. Uh, another topic, did Willie Mays, well, this might lead into it. Did Willie Mays get a bum rap in San Francisco? He came from New York with a huge reputation preceding Ooh. him. He was not homegrown like Willie mm -hmm. McCovey. Uh, and you know he hit 300 for his career, but that meant that a kid like me was angry with him seven out of every 10 yeah. at-bats because he made out. And it was Willie damn Mays, and it should go over the fence every time or off the fence and didn't. So did he feel that burden of great expectations? Do you think, does he think that? Yes, but not for the reasons that you say, because if you are hitless in seven out of 10, you're pretty darn good. What the burden was for him was he came to a town in his prime, the greatest player and the most entertaining player in the country, trying to meet new friends, you know, create his own legacy on the West Coast. And the first thing he came up with, well, there's a whole bunch of old timers and traditionalists in the Bay Area. And guess what? This is Joe DiMaggio's town. And that's Joe DiMaggio's position, center field, and that's Joe DiMaggio's ballpark, Seal Stadium. So who are you? Who's Willie Mays? Which now you say, gosh darn, what were they smoking? But back then, there was a lot of that. There was a, um, a lot of pushback to the greatness of Willie Mays because he wasn't DiMaggio. Even though DiMaggio played there decades earlier in the 30s in the old Pacific Coast League from Martinez and you know, the family of the three brothers and the greatness and the hitting streak and the Yankee Clipper and all that stuff. And by the time Mays showed up, you know, well, prove it. Well, he did, but it took him a while. And maybe not until the 62 series when he hit that home run to beat the Dodgers in that three-game playoff did maybe some of these old-timers come around. But I've spoken with a lot of guys who were kids at that time who just adored Mays. And went to Seal Stadium in 58 and 59, and he was the show. And I talked to Felipe Alou, and he said, you know, when we went into towns, it was me and Orlando and Marichal and Perry and, you know, my two brothers and, and, and on and on and on. But the newspaper would say, you know, Willie Mays and company, according to Felipe. So all these other legends, McCovey, um, were kind of left out in Mays' shadow, which, you know, I don't know of any complaints. I didn't hear them complaining. They're not complaining now because they realized he was the one. I'm great, but that man is up there in the solar system, as Felipe said. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it was DiMaggio, you know, the, the greatness of DiMaggio that the greatness of Mays had to overcome for, for just goofy-ass reasons when you look back at it. But then it was real. You mentioned John Roseboro earlier, mm. uh, Dodger catcher, involved in one of the most famous, infamous uh, incidents 
in giant Dodger history. Juan Marichal, the giant pitcher, is at bat. Roseboro throws the ball back to the pitcher, either clips or comes close to clipping Marichal in the ear. Marichal turns around, cracks Roseboro on the head. Hell breaks out. Uh, Willie Mays, in your recount of it, sort of becomes a, a conciliator or a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. uh, really quickly about that, because it leads to something else I want to ask. Yeah, it was Candlestick Park. And there were a lot of side stories that led up to this, but it was the last game of a series and all kinds of um, things happening in different countries that Marichal and Roseboro. Um, and Sandy Koufax was on the mound, and he threw at nobody. He never threw up and in to anybody, and he wouldn't do it. So Marichal was thrown at the Dodgers, and Koufax wouldn't retaliate. So Johnny Roseboro, the catcher, took it upon himself to do so and threw it so close on a throwback to the mound that he clipped Marichal, who turned around and clubbed him 17 stitches later. Um, you know, Roseboro is just irate. And he wants, he's looking at this blood, he's like losing his mind, he's, and he's going over after Marichal. And Mays grabs him in the, in the chest, pulls his jersey. And there's some great clips of this. He, he brings Johnny Roseboro, at Candlestick Park, over to the Dodger dugout, all alone in a sea of blue. And there's Mays bringing Roseboro to safety to prevent what could have been just a crazy riot in the stands, on the field. And that was the peacemaker that you, that you talked about. But there's, it was an amazing thing. But I talked to Maury Wills for the book, the Dodger shortstop at the time, their captain. And he said, yeah, anybody else who did that, we wouldn't have allowed it. But when we see Mays pulling Roseboro off, said, okay, let's follow Mays to our dugout. Just unheard of. Great peacemaker, great conciliator. Now we go to 1962. I'm in the second deck behind third base at Candlestick, and I see the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life on a baseball field. Uh, the Giants are playing the New York Mets, uh, statistically the worst baseball team in the history of the earth. Until this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody's going to ask about the A's, I okay. promise. Uh, there's a play at second base. The shortstop, Elio Chacon, mm. slaps a tag on Willie Mays' head. Apparently, Willie Mays thought it was a little too aggressive. He popped to his feet, slid one arm through Elio Chacon's crotch grabbed the other arm around his neck, flipped him over, and body slammed him. You've never seen anything better on Friday night wrestling. It was fantastic. I'll never forget it. So is Willie Mays the humanitarian peacemaker, or is he a ball player with a volcano inside, volcano inside waiting to erupt? Who started that fight? Well, Willie Mays is going to say Elio Chacon. Well, of course he did. Him. Yeah, he whacked him, and then Willie Mays got up and body slammed him. Willie didn't start fights, but he didn't run away from fights. He broke up an awful lot, mostly Brooklyn and New York back in Polo Grounds and Ebbets Field. But yeah, that moment, in fact, I remember going on the radio, KNBR or something, the day before his birthday, this is 92nd, just in May, and we were talking about, I was saying the same thing, you know, Mays, you know, the, the peacekeeper and didn't start fights and and never, never charged the mound or anything. So in the Giants clubhouse that day on his 92nd, um, they were real careful because Willie, you know, he's not seen, he's not mobile, he's not getting around too, too much. And, and so his handlers said, okay, let's just have an hour here. We'll have maybe two or three Giants come in, local guys, you know, Brandon Crawford, Jock Peterson, maybe, maybe one more, and Mitch Hanniger or whatever. And then next thing I looked around, I said, there's a line out the frickin' door. I mean, everybody wants to say hello to this guy. <laughs> and and uh, so, yeah, um, what was the question, man? <laughs> is he the peacemaker yeah. or is he the so, body slammer so, on Friday So the, the, the moral of that story in the clubhouse at, at, at Oracle Park was he, he joked with these guys about the Mexico City trip in which the Giants got swept and gave up a bunch of home runs and Mays was saying, you know, because the Giants hit a bunch of home runs, too. He said, you, you hit 15 home runs in two days and you lost? He said, and he said, Marichal would have had them on the ground. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. I just got done with this interview talking about you're the peacemaker. And you're talking about Marichal's going to throw inside and, and get these batters out, away, from, <laughs> away from the box so that, you know, that he would have control of the at-bat. 
But no, I mean, he was playful. He was not serious. This, this okay. is, you know, many years later, the, people like to brag about how tough they were. But Willie Mays was tough. And Google Lon Simmons, Elio Chacon, and Willie Mays fight. Those words, you're going to hear an amazing soundtrack of Lon Simmons describing that play. Wow. I've heard it a hundred oh, times, and it's just beautiful. You don't, see the, you don't see the video, but you hear the audio. And my God, it's just amazing. That's, I can't wait to yeah. do that. So Ruth, I have three terribly insightful questions <laughs> left. Do I have time to ask them? OK. Um, you wrote a lot in the book about Willie Mays as a hitter. And you should have been arrested if you didn't, because he's world famous for that. But I thought your best writing was about his defense. You mm. did a chapter on him as a center fielder, and there aren't a lot of statistics for defense beyond fielding percentage that no one cares about. But you had to be almost poetic to describe mm. uh, the grace and the chase of a fly ball, the pre-positioning, the basket catch. It gave me the feeling that maybe you um, admire him more for his glove mm. than for his bat. Is that true, and if so, why? Well, probably because I asked him. I said, you know, here's a man who kind of invented five tools. I mean, he, he and Mantle, uh, you know, Mays had the durability, lasted a lot longer, and um, probably a better defender, better runner, and all, all that stuff. But in terms of the five tools, hitting, hitting for power, defending, throwing, and running, there was... Uh, you can't say that one tool was better than the other. And there's probably not another person who ever played the game where there's like no, we don't know if he threw better than he hit or you know, he ran better than he hit for power or, or any, it's just all, you know, scouts would call it 80, which is the highest praise. But um, yeah, he, he, he was, he, I mean, five tool player, um, and we talk about the sixth tool because he talks about it. But in terms of the five tools, I asked him, I said, what's, what's your favorite tool? I'm thinking, okay, he hit 600 home runs, he hit 300, he's got all these RBIs and runs scored, he probably had a blast playing the game offensively, and he said, my defense. I said, your defense? He said, yeah, because you could hit the ball you know, on the screws four times in the game and go 0 for 4, but defense never slumps. And defense, I could still help the team win with my defense, whether it's chasing down a ball in the gap or throwing guy out at third base. And I said, okay, okay. So the chapter you reference is, uh, is him basically explaining just that because how many players today say defense is more fun than offense? Or that's, you know, they're, they're, they're more, they, you know, they get more kicks out of beating them on defense. That, it just, it just doesn't happen, but that was him. Okay. Two questions ago, uh, the first one, probably maybe the most important, race. You mentioned it. Uh, he started out in the Negro Leagues because he wasn't allowed in the major leagues. Even after Jackie Robinson kicked the door down, uh, he had to face the bigotry, the hatred, the segregation um, that black players, maybe even up to today, still experience. Um, Jackie Robinson, according to your book, and I think I've heard this elsewhere, felt disappointed that Willie Mays didn't stand up enough against mm. bigotry, didn't make a, a big enough case to end segregation. But we're not all born to, no, I'm gonna be an apologist here, we're not all born uh, to be Martin Luther King mm. or Gandhi or Jackie Robinson. Um, do you feel Willie Mays should have done more? Does Willie Mays feel Willie Mays should have done more uh, to speak out and act out against racial discrimination and bigotry in the ballpark? So I, I read all the books. I watched all the documentaries. I, I thought I knew everything about Mays, and that included Willie never did enough during, you know, during, you know, for, for, for you know, racism, for for people of color, for um, equality. And you know, I bought into it, because that's all I knew. And then I, I asked him, and he gave me a different story. And I said, OK. So then I went around and spoke with a whole lot of people, Maury Wills and Reggie Jackson and Hank Aaron, who was only three years younger, um, Frank Robinson, um, uh, McCovey, and, and on and on. And every one of those guys had a story about how influential Mays was during the civil rights era for us. 
You know, he, he wasn't like Jackie. He didn't march. He didn't preach. He did it on his terms. And I found out all this later, and the documentary kind of takes that from the book and makes it huge in the HBO documentary that came out in November on Willie and kind of took it to another level. But Jackie Robinson wrote a book in 1964, Baseball Has Done It. It's an oral history um, in which he tried to get everybody in the game, whether it was white or black or Latino, give me your thoughts about um, the integration of baseball and what it meant to you. The two guys said no. One was Maury Wills and one was Willie Mays. And Jackie just ripped them in this book, in the, in the forward. He just criticized these two guys. And in particular, Willie, for saying, here's, here's a guy from the slums in Birmingham, moves into this you know, wonderful uh, house overlooking the water in San Francisco, and he doesn't have the time to tell his story. You know, and on the surface, you say, yeah, what's wrong with Willie? But you look deeper and you talk to Willie, and, and Willie was born, like I explained, in the environment that you know, we couldn't imagine. And his parents didn't get married. They were very young. His mom took off and married someone else, had 10 kids. And so it was only his father, who was gone a lot, he worked on trains, and he played baseball, and he worked in the mills. And Willie Howard May Sr. always said, don't talk too much. Don't fight back. You know, do what you're told. And you, you got to remember, this is, this is a guy who came before Ali and Bill Russell and Jim Brown. He paved the way for those guys. Maybe the first superstar coming out of World War II, African American or minority or, or any. I mean, Jackie you know, opened the door. And he played by the rules for two years. And then Willie and Hank and Ernie, these guys busted it down and played their way. So I, I just think that um, it was unfair because you know, all these legendary ballplayers told me so. And I, I wrote it that way. And then Willie explained, like Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan is like, Mace was like a big brother to Joe Morgan. But nobody ever knew that. And I had a long discussion with Joe about that. And he told me how influential Willie was in his life and about how, you know, leaving the game better than you found it, leaving your house better, leaving the family better, all of that stuff. And it's just things that we never heard maybe publicly in newspapers or magazines or documentaries back in the day. Couldn't find it in microfiche. But, but now you look back and say, wow. And then it's, it's beautifully presented in the documentary um, by maybe folks who... who who used, who used these anecdotes and, and put them on the big screen. It was pretty fabulous. Last question, and it's the greatest of all time. There are folks I know in this room who'd sit here till midnight debating the topic. Uh, we're gonna give you two, three minutes tops. Okay. You make the case, and a lot of others have before you and will after you, that Willie Mays is the greatest of all time. Mm. The one thing I didn't see you mention or mention much, two names that I, I think you have to include Babe Ruth and Shohei Otani <laughs> for this reason. Uh, elite hitters, but elite pitchers. Willie Mays can't pitch, so why is he the greatest of all time? Here's why. And I'm not a homer. I'm not. You know, I'm just. I'm the, just right down the middle, objective reporter on this. <laughs> <laughs> a so, vote from the mafia. Is that true? <laughs> Listen, when, when Willie Mays came out of the Birmingham Black Barons, there were two area newspapers that projected he would be a major league pitcher, not a major league hitter. That's how good his arm was. Because he would make throws 18, 19, 20 in the Negro Leagues that nobody's ever seen. He would make plays that nobody's ever seen. And he was going against legends, men in their 20s and early 30s. He's a five-tool player, like I said. Is, is Babe Ruth? Well, he could throw. Could he run? Could he defend? Yeah, he hit. He hit for power. So maybe two, two, two tools. Obviously, Mays dominated him. But Joe Pasnowski wrote a book a couple of years ago of the top 100 players of all time. And online kind of produced the chapters going from 100 all the way. And Oscar Charleston of the Negro Leagues is number five. And Ted Williams is up there. Bonds is up there. You know, Stan Musial, Ted Williams. All these guys are in the top 10. 
And I'm thinking, okay, after number three, I think it was Hank, there's two left. And I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to see, you know, Willie Mays number two, because obviously everyone thinks Babe Ruth is number one. So I woke up and I saw Babe Ruth number two. I said, oh my God, this guy's putting Willie Mays as the all time greatest player. And, you know, he, he wrote a great chapter about that in the book. But not only that, but I mean, who's the best? Who, 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 are, who are we to decide? Everybody has a judgment call. You could say, well, Babe Ruth pitched and Willie didn't. I explained that he was projected to be a pitcher. You could also say, well, he dominated his league in the 20s more than anyone in history. Well, to that I would say, who was the competition? It was an all-white league. Satchel Paige never pitched to him in the big leagues. Oscar Charleston never chased down a ball in the gap when Babe hit it in the big leagues. Barnstorming, yeah, but you don't see those numbers. So I would say that Willie played against better competition, you know, Latino players and African-American players and, and the best white players. And Babe Ruth played against the, ba the best white players. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons I would say Mays, but th those, those kind of stand out to me. Um, you know, bigger competition and uh, not only the greatest player, but the most entertaining and the most durable. My favorite stat in the book, 13 straight years, 150 plus games. Lou Gehrig didn't do that. Cal Ripken Jr. didn't do that. 13 straight years, 150 plus games. And most of that streak came during the 154 game season. So the guy played every single day. Double headers. They played 20, 30 double headers in his early years. Spring training, the managers, who many of whom weren't great during the, during the Giants era, he had two or three really good ones, but four or five not so good ones, they, they played him all the time. And he burnt out, but there was, there was no travel like it is today. There's no attrition like it is today. There was, there was nothing like that, sleeping habits that they teach these guys now. But with Mays, you know, he overcame all of that and didn't complain about the polo grounds in Candlestick Park, the two goofiest ballparks in baseball history. 482 to center in the polo grounds and a fly ball to left field goes to right field at Candlestick Park. <laughs> and he never complained, he just adjusted. He learned how to hit it in the jet stream and right center, uh, learned how to pull it down the lines at polo, the polo grounds, and you know, the polo grounds were built for him because he could run forever, and he did, as we saw in the 1954 clip of Game 1 of the World Series, Vic Wirtz's shot. I don't know what you folks think about this, and I don't care because I have had a great hour <laughs> talking to John Shea, so I'd like to thank him. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And now uh, we'll do questions. And I guess I'm going to repeat the questions because there is a group on uh, ah. uh, Zoom that's listening in, including a group I understand, oh. the New York Giants, what are they called? Preservation Society. Who knew? If you're on Zoom, keep going, guys. Where's Maybe the you'll camera? Get your Giants back. Where's the camera? Uh, where is the camera? I don't, I don't know. know. They're looking at us. Okay. Okay, so you, uh, you give your question. Uh, I'll repeat. John will answer. Anybody. But yeah, Gary Mintz and company from New York. It, it, it started at 10 o'clock back there. And these are some legends who followed the team back in 57, 56. And they still became giant fans because of Mays. And they'll admit that. So it, they, they meet every Thursday, and it's a wonderful group. God Shout bless out. the Preservation Society. Question in the front row. You interviewed him for 100 hours. Yeah. Hmm. The question is, uh, John interviewed Willie Mays over 100 hours. What is something Willie Mays said that really surprised John? Uh, There's one time I, I told Willie, I said, I can't get Hank Aaron. He's got a handler. He keeps telling me no. He keeps telling me no. And w Willie, Willie's, one of his favorite lines is, he took care of me. He took care of me. He took care of me. He's talking about the, the Negro League teammates. He's talking about the New York Giants, his managers, his, his, you know, his friends, whatever. In those New York years, everyone took care of him. By the time he got to San Francisco, he took care of everybody else, and he has been ever since. So one time, I'm saying, I just can't get Hank, man. I'm not going to finish this book until there's a Willie and Hank chapter. So he got his number? I said, yeah. 
but I'm, you know, I'm trying to go through the right channel. Give a call. I said, okay. So I'm calling him. I got him on speakerphone. Here's, put it down. And Hank and Willie are talking. And I'm thinking, who, who doesn't belong in this picture? <laughs> I mean, and Willie takes pride in taking care of people. And like I said, Hank was three years younger. So to this day, well, you know, until Hank passed, Willie always said, what can I do for you? And I, I went back to the tape and like five times he said, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Let me know what I can do for you. And Hank never said that because he was like the little brother. And Hank Aaron, you know, he's nobody's little brother. But Willie Mays, you know, that, that was the beauty of it. it. It was always, you know, what can I do for other people? And he still, you know, I visited him. He says, how's your daughter? How's her knee? You know, she just had a little accident. So it's like, really? That is just amazing that you... Of all the people you know, you're asking me about, you know, my daughter, and, and um, yeah, just, that, that, that's pretty killer. Who else has got a question for John Shea? Over here, gentlemen. Yeah, I, I heard you at one point, you mentioned a sixth tool. Yeah. And I, I could maybe say it was Christ, but I don't know if it's baseball smarts, because yeah. you're an intelligent player, but what are your thoughts? So the question is, uh, John Shea earlier mentioned a sixth tool tool for baseball players. What is the sixth tool, John? Well, unlike the first five, the sixth can't be quantified, right? It's the mental game. It's preparing. It's envisioning. It's anticipating before anything happens. He'll tell a teammate, this is going to be the pitch. And he would meet with Gaylord Perry and Juan Marichal, the co-aces of those legendary teams, for two minutes. They call them the two-minute meeting before their starts. And he would watch them in the bullpen, or they would tell them, you know, what's working, what's not. How are you going to face this guy? And, and Mays, accordingly, you know, played the gap or shaded him over here. And I talked to Tom Seaver about this. He said, yeah, he did the same thing with me when he got traded to the Mets, and nobody ever did that for me. Nobody ever asked me, hey, what's working in the bullpen? How are we going to face, you know, position players? You know, they never talk. But Mays was a different breed as the first African-American captain in baseball history, a guy that many players I interviewed said he was really our manager because the shortstop would look, where, where, where should I play this guy, you know? <laughs> in Bonds in right field or Henderson in left, those are later years, you know, move in or move out. And the manager said, well, hey, he's the guy, he, he, he deferred. One time at an all-star game, Walter Alston, the uh, Dodger manager, who was the all-star manager, went to Willie and said, hey, man, I, I'm not sure about this lineup. He said, Give it to me. So, so <laughs> May, Willie said, I'm batting first. <laughs> Clemente, he'll go to right field. Aaron, and then McCovey. And he said, after that, write in the, who the hell you want. <laughs> and the true story. So, yeah, his leadership and awareness as maybe the smartest player ever. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, smartest, best, most talent, you know, uh, you know, with the most entertaining with the basket catch and the cap flying off and, you know, the way he enjoyed the interaction with the fans, you know, the, and the durability. I mean, there's seven tools. We can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Six is enough. Um, I got to say, we'll get to questions, but a quick shout out. I don't like name droppers, but this guy, very, uh, just by the, oh, by the way, Clinton, Obama, Bush, Aaron, Wills, um, Seaver. I, amazing the life this guy's had as a baseball man, and he doesn't brag about it. I just think it's fabulous. Questions again. Uh, gentlemen back here in the glasses. So Ooh. the question is, uh, compare the talents of Barry Bonds and Willie Mays. Is, is Barry here? <laughs> <laughs> He's with Glenn Dickey tonight. Barry, Barry's told me many times that Willie and I are the greatest ever. I mean, not once did Willie ever said Barry and I are the greatest ever. <laughs> That's a different mindset, right? <laughs> Barry, you know, Barry's Barry. And um, the great story with, with Bonds and Mays is really goes back to Bobby Bonds and how Bobby was supposed to be the next Mays, which was so unfair 
because nobody ever could live up to that. And there was pressure on him, and you know, he, 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 he drank a lot, and he got traded a lot. And, but Willie always looked out for him and continued to play golf with him, he and Davenport and some other guys. And there was this five-year-old kid always in Willie's locker, you know, taking his gum and kicking him and stealing his bat and putting his glove on backwards, and that was Barry Bonds, Bobby's kid. So, um, you know, fast forward, you know, so, so basically, Willie looked out for both those, took care of both those guys. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and Bobby is dying of cancer. He's at his deathbed. Willie goes to visit him and said, Willie, you take care of Barry for me because you're the only guy other than me that he listens to. So Willie took that and ran with it. And it was Mays who was at Bonds' locker during the home run chases, the performance enhancing drug stories, all the abuse he was taking. I saw Mays at his locker a lot. I saw Mays pull Barry into Mike Murphy, the clubhouse man's office, a lot. One time I saw Mays and Bonds in the middle of the room and Willie was stretching his hammy. You know, Willie's stretching Barry's hammy. So he, he was there for him all the time. So he took that to heart. I'm gonna watch out for this guy. And, and a kind of a payback, I was telling you about the 92nd birthday for Willie. Bonds was in the room, the governor, a lot of you know, big important people, right? It was Willie Mays' birthday, so everyone wants to be there. And I'm watching in the corner, and it's, you know, Willie's in a chair, and he's kind of leaning, leaning, leaning. And who's at his side, putting a strong leg up to him to make sure he's straightened out but Barry Bonds, you know? So, <clears throat> yeah, all these years later, um, that trifecta of outfielders, Barry likes to say, I'm in left, Willie's in center, and my dad is in right. You know, quite a family we had. Questions over here? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. The question is, before Peloton and all that other <laughs> stuff that we hate, how did Willie Mays work out? Did you see Brad Mangin's picture, maybe three or four deep, when Willie had his shirt off and holding the bat at his locker? Oh, my God. <laughs> he never lifted weights. I mean, so he says, I mean, there were no weights. They didn't do that. McCovey used to get so ticked off because Willie would show up whenever he showed up for spring training. And McCovey said, the guy's in mid-season form now. You know, we're trying to lose weight. We're wearing all these plastic sleeves and, <laughs> and, and uh, the way they used to lose weight back then, the rubber. And, and Mays just shows up and goes three for four in Scottsdale and then goes home and plays golf. <laughs> and you can't, you know, I, I was criticized once because I said, you know, it's innate, it's natural. And I said, no, 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 you can't, don't, don't, don't be going there. And I, obviously, Willie worked and worked and worked as a kid and loved the game. His dad rolled him his first ball in the crib, you know, just six months. And, and then when he got older, he ran it down in the corner room. And, but, you know, his dad, who played catch with him as a kid, Willie still talks about the games of catch and how every day we talked about something else, maybe how to play left field, maybe how to speak to people, maybe how to get better grades. And it was always through that game of catch, father and son, that Willie looks back at now as the most inspirational person in his life. He, he just has example after example. But that, that's, yeah, that, that amazing uh, relationship between father and son. Ruth, we got time for a couple more? Are we... Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, all the way in the back. Have you had a chance to a chance to talk about the Field of Dreams game? Okay. Yeah, so next year at Rickwood Field, I said the Giants and Cardinals are gonna play in that one game. And I asked Renee Anderson, who's on Zoom right now, his, um, Willie's friend and longtime uh, assistant, and uh, you know, probably the, the, the most amazing saint ever because um, everything Willie does kind of passes through Renee. And I said, Renee, does he know? He says, yeah, he knows. So it's kind of special. That was, that was his roots. You know, when I went back there, 
and visited it and went out to center field and stood in the box and you know in the clubhouse and the dugout where he was in 48 49 50 and then brought those you know magical moments back to him he like closed his eyes and envisioned himself in center field and hearing the train over his right shoulder and the advertisements and the big scoreboard over his other shoulder and yeah um, he knows about it and it's going to be it's going to be all, it's going to be a great thing and it's just you know field of dreams in Iowa that's the spiffy, beautiful, sparkly ballpark. And, you know, this needs some work. And hopefully, because the seating is, you know, all different colors. And hopefully they just leave it alone. But Major League Baseball might come in and hopefully doesn't take away from the spirit of it all. Okay, you get one more question because I just decided I get the last one. Gentlemen back there. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Question is, what does, why does Willie Mays think the Giants only went to the World Series once uh, in that decade, in the well, 60s? Because he's a hitter, he'll blame the lack of pitching. And he said, we had Marichal and Perry, and that was kind of it. And that really showed through in 1971 when they were playing Pittsburgh, and they didn't really have much beyond those two guys. But the Giants had the most wins in the 60s of any team in the majors. And Marshall had the most wins in the 60s of any pitcher in the majors. They were damn good. They finished second five times in a row. 96, 97, 98 wins. Nowadays, that would get you like a bye to the World Series almost. But then it was like third place. I mean, the teams were wonderful. Bob Gibson and St. Louis and all those Cubs who finished in last place, half the rosters on, you know, in, in the Hall of Fame now. Um, Philadelphia and... Los Angeles, of course, the nemesis, you know, they had Drysdale and Koufax and Maury Wills, and they would beat you one nothing. but they also had Don Sutton, and they had, they had plenty of pitching, and it was, a, it was a great park at Dodger Stadium for them to win Ebbets Field, but yeah, I think uh, I, he makes no excuses, but he said if there was one more pitcher, which they had in 62, they went five deep, but that was it. Okay, to finish up, I'm going to pander. Um, we were at dinner, and we were talking about heroes. And you had a story about, I don't want to give away the punchline of all this, but I hope you remember, I don't remember this, no. uh, the number one hero in America. Oh. Explain that. Well, a fellow named uh, Frank Lewis, who is part of the New York, didn't I say this? Did I say he was the number one hero? Yeah. This, you didn't tell us stories. So got it, OK. I spoke with this gentleman for the first time. He's 84 years old. And I called him for a story and just an interview just to check out. Because he, 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 was, he was there in 57, saw the Giants leave, and kind of gave up on the team. Whereas a lot of the other guys in the New York Giants Preservation Society did not. So I wanted to hear, I said, what, you know, in relation to the A's who were moving. And he, he, he picks up the phone and, and like the first thing he says, instead of, hi, John, how you doing? What do you need? <laughs> Willie Mays is the number one hero in America. I said, you know, I've never heard that. I've never heard that, but, and I'm thinking I'm going around the horn here and trying to make a top 10 list and we lost a lot of people. You, know, you can't pick a president because half the population hates the guy and the other population. So I said, man, that's amazing for what he did, for the amount of people he inspired. And I don't know if I was clear enough tonight about, about all that, about what he meant to generations of people, kids, you know, the Say Hey Kid, he's got a foundation, the Say Hey Foundation, you know, where he helps people who might need assistance on, you know, which path to take in life. And that's what he was as a kid, you know, he didn't, know which way to go, and he got assistance from people who took care of him. And um, yeah, I guess I could go on and on in terms of the inspiration, but he inspired me too, you know, just through our talks, because it's like he's so kind and respectful to people that he doesn't know, and then once he warms to you, it's like you're, you're an old teammate, and 
you know, you're, you're, you're razzing each other and you're poking fun of each other. And, but at the end of the day, he, he says, well, you know, what can I do for you? Or what can I do for this group? And, you know, he's, he's orchestrating a lot um, later in his life here. And that, that stuff never went away. And I think it's, um, it's uh, you know, he inspires people who inspire others. And, you know, he talks to parents about this. Um, you know, as a player, he changed lives and he changed minds and he's still doing it. So I want to thank John Shea. I want to thank from the Lafayette Library, Lori Miles and Ruth Thornburg. And I don't know about you, but this is the most fun I've ever had in the library. So John, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just want to remind you there are books for sale back there, and John's making a really good price available tonight. And also, Brad, our photographer, you have a book about Buster Posey, I think. And uh, I know there's a lot of people here who are recording big Buster <laughs> Posey fans, so look for that as well. But anyway, stay if you want, get a book, have John sign it. Thank you so much for coming. Mm. You are fabulous. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Fabulous. Thanks. 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 Thanks.